The majority view in scholarship today is that pre-exilic Israel shared the polytheistic worldview of her pagan neighbors. In this view, Yahweh was a member of the Pantheon, one of the sons of Elyon, and became Israel's national god, according to their interpretation of Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. Over time, Yahweh subsumed the characteristics of the gods of Canaan and emerged as the head of the Pantheon, according to their view of Psalm 82. And Israel slowly evolved into monotheism and their scriptures were then redacted and all traces of the previous polytheism were removed. As Michael Heiser says, quote, This evolution, according to the consensus view, was achieved through the zealous commitment of Israelite scribes who edited and reworked the Hebrew Bible to reflect emerging monotheism and to compel the laity to embrace the idea, end quote. Except if you read the works of these same scholars who promote this consensus opinion, they also state that all traces of the previous polytheism were not fully redacted. And that's why we have Deuteronomy 32 and Psalm 82, because these passages, according to them, are vestiges of Israel's polytheistic past. And as I mentioned, Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 is cited in support of this evolutionary view by assuming that Yahweh and El Yon are separate deities. As Michael Heiser says, quote, this consensus view lacks coherence on several points, end quote. And so the point of our study today is to examine Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 to determine whether or not Yahweh and El Yon are the same deity or separate deities. And I will be quoting a lot of scholarship as much has been written on this topic and I want you to get an idea of what the academic community says about these passages. So, first let's start off by reading Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 says, When the Most High, which is Elyon, when Elyon gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But Yahweh's portion is his people, Jacob his allotted heritage. So the first scholar that we're going to go through today is Mark S. Smith. And specifically, I pulled quotes from his book, God in Translation. And Mark S. Smith is one scholar who holds to and promotes the consensus view as described above. But let's see what he acknowledges even while holding to this other more popular view. Again, in his book, God in Translation, I'm going to give you also the page numbers along with the quotes. So on page 142, he says, quote, Despite possible appearances to the contrary, the composer did not intend any picture of polytheism with his rendering of verses 8 and 9. In fact, he likely thought of El and El Yon simply as two of Yahweh's titles, as they are elsewhere in the Bible, and not as a separate god, El, end quote. On page 197, he says, quote, It is important to note that despite the differences, all of the textual witnesses understood the poem to be monotheistic, end quote. And by textual witnesses, he's talking about, uh, for example, the Masoretic text, which is the Hebrew text, or the Septuagint, the Greek text, or the Aramaic Targums. He's saying that all of, the, all of those um, textual witnesses understood Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 to be monotheistic. He goes on to say on page 203, quote, More specifically, the original composer understood El Elyon as a title of Yahweh. This is no mere guess or supposition, based simply on attestations of El Elyon as a title of Yahweh, as in Genesis 14, 19-22. There is specific evidence within the biblical corpus for this equation or identification of El Elyon with Yahweh in Deuteronomy 8 and 9, end quote. And he points out on page 204 that Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 19 says that Yahweh is the one who apportioned the host of heaven to the nations, not El Yon. So I'm going to read Deuteronomy 419 here, and then we're going to discuss that one for a few minutes. Deuteronomy 419 says, And when you look up into the sky and see the sun, moon, and stars, all the forces of heaven, don't be seduced into worshiping them. Yahweh your God gave them to all the peoples of the earth. As Michael Heiser says, quote, In Deuteronomy 4, 19 and 20, 
a passage recognized by all who comment on these issues as an explicit parallel to 32, 8, and 9. The text informs us that it was Yahweh who allotted the nations to the host of heaven and who took Israel as his own inheritance. Neither the verb forms nor the ideas are passive. Israel was not given to Yahweh by El, which is the picture that scholars who separate El and Yahweh in Deuteronomy 32 want to fashion. In view of the, clo in view of the close relationship of Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 to Deuteronomy 4, 19 and 20, it is more consistent to have Yahweh taking Israel for his own terrestrial allotment by sovereign act as Lord of the Council. End quote. So back to Mark S. Smith, on page 204 and 205 of the same book, God in Translation, he says, quote, In short, 419 presupposes the identification of El Elyon as the God of Israel in 32.8, end quote. And in, on page 207 and 208, he says, quote, However one is to resolve the interpretation of the other nations and their astral worship in Deuteronomy 419, the verse shows an assumption of Yahweh as the God fully in control over the divine arrangement, with little credence given to the astral bodies, end quote. And some scholars also could uh, suggest a connection between Deuteronomy 419 and Nehemiah 9.6. So Nehemiah 9.6 says, you are Yahweh, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them. The host of heaven worships you. So the host of heaven here in Deuteronomy 4.19 and Nehemiah 9.6 are the other divine beings. And they are all creations of Yahweh. And as it says in Nehemiah 9.6, they worship Yahweh. So back to Mark S. Smith on page 208, he says, quote, In sum, these echoes of Deuteronomy 32, 8, and 9 in the book of Deuteronomy show a monotheistic reading that identifies Yahweh as El Elyon, end quote. And I have two more quotes from Mark S. Smith on page 211. He says, quote, What we perhaps have in Deuteronomy 32, 8, and 9 is a notion of minor divinities who serve the absolute divine king, these are, relatively speaking, so powerless compared to Yahweh that for the composer, they do not truly constitute gods like Yahweh. They are perhaps the Elim of the Qumran songs of the Sabbath sacrifice. Minor divinities, actually angels, but hardly gods in the modern conventional sense, end quote. And lastly, on page 215, he says, quote, Deuteronomy 32 in telling the story of Israel's relationship with its God, begins with a single divine head, Yahweh El Elyon, end quote. The Dictionary of Deities and Demons also has an entry on El Yon, and it was written by Elness and Miller. So I'm going to read some of that. They say, in the present form of the biblical text, the term El Yon is understood to be an epithet for Yahweh, the God of Israel. However, some scholars find reflections of an earlier stage of tradition where the title El Yon may have referred originally to a god other than Yahweh. The primary examples of such occurrences are Genesis 14, 18 to 22, Numbers 24, 16, and Deuteronomy 32, 8. With regard to the last passage, some scholars find an early reference to El Yon as a supreme god to which Yahweh is subordinate. Elion divides the nations among the gods and grants Yahweh an allotment like the rest. Yet, contextual considerations suggest that the preposition key in verse 9 be translated as an asseverative particle, rendering the verse, Indeed, Yahweh's own portion was his people. Jacob was the territory of his possession. Thus, Elion is more plausibly understood as functioning as an epithet for Yahweh." End quote. And Chun Long So, who does a lot of work in biblical wisdom literature, has also commented on Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, and he says, quote, In verse 9 of the poem, some see a primitive subordination of Yahweh to El Yon, but this is too literal an interpretation of a mythopoic text. 
it seems more likely that Elyon is an epithet of Yahweh, end quote. And Theodore J. Lewis, in his book, The Origin and Character of God, says on page 88, quote, It seems reasonable to conclude, along with Elness and Miller, that Elyon was a common epithet in the West Semitic region applied at different times and in different cultures to any god thought to be supreme, end quote. And then he says on page 94, quote, the application of the title El Yon to Yahweh was ubiquitous, end quote. I also want to comment briefly on Genesis 14.22. And Genesis 14.22 is the verse in which Abram swears by Yahweh El El Yon. And Genesis 14 is often brought into the discussion by scholars when discussing this issue of El Yon and Yahweh. And the Dictionary of Deities and Demons has a comment on this verse also, and they say, quote, According to the Greek translation of Genesis 14, 18 through 20, God the Most High is none but Yahweh, the God of Abraham, the creator of heaven and earth, end quote. And Claus Vesterman, in his Genesis commentary, also comments on this issue, and he says, quote, an oath is taken by the name of God. It is not at all possible that the original was merely the divine predicate and that Yahweh was added later, end quote. Because some scholars do want to say that the original um, text of Genesis 14 didn't have Yahweh El Elyon, but that was added later by um, scribes as part of this redactional process that we mentioned at the start. But uh, Claus Vesterman here says that is, quote, not at all possible. So, and also Robert Alter, who's professor of Hebrew at Cal Berkeley, comments on this same verse. And he says, quote, whatever Melchizedek's theology, Abr Abram elegantly co-ops him for monotheism by using El Elyon in its orthodox Israelite sense, end quote. And the orthodox Israelite sense of El Yon is to view El Yon as a title or an epithet of Yahweh. It says in Psalm 83 verse 18, that they may know that you alone, whose name is Yahweh, are El Yon over all the earth. In the Second Temple Jewish writings, the Greek ho hepsistos is what was used to translate the Most High, El Yon. And Ben Sira used hypsistos also in place of the tetragrammaton Yahweh in chapter 12, verse 2. And there are two passages in the book of Ben Sira, specifically chapter 17, verse 17, and chapter 44, verses 1 and 2, that understand El Elyon as Yahweh. In commenting on the Jewish belief during the Second Temple period in relation to El Yon, the Dictionary of Deities and Demons re references Philo, and they say, quote, Philo leaves no door open to interpret the expression in a polytheistic manner. After citing Septuagint of Genesis 14.18, Philo excludes the possibility that there is any other Most High, end quote. And in the Septuagint, as well as the New Testament, Elion is translated with this same word, hypsistos, including the most famous biblical Elyon passages that we've been discussing here, Genesis 14, Deuteronomy 32, and Numbers 24. And the DDD, Dictionary of Deities and Demons, again says, quote, In the Greek translations of the Hebrew Bible, Elyon is always translated by hepsistos. In these instances, as in the Greek literature of Judaism of the Second Temple period, and in the literature of primitive Christianity, the expression ho hepsistos refers to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in the New Testament, Luke uses this phrase ho hepsistos five times in his gospel and twice in Acts as a title for God. Jesus is also called the Son of the Most High or the Son of Hepsistos in Luke 8:28 and Mark 4, um, sorry, Mark 5:7. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 76, Zechariah prophesied that his son, John the Baptist, would be the prophet of the Most High, the prophet of Hypsistos. Or if he were speaking Hebrew, it would have been the prophet of El Yon. And Luke 1, 76 says, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. 
So even right here in Luke's usage of this phrase, we see the two terms in parallel. You will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord. So just like in Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, we had Elion and Yahweh. Right here in Luke 176, we have Hepsistos and Kyrios. The Most High and the Lord. So I, I would say that Luke here is using these phrases and these ideas in the same manner that Moses is using them in Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. The Most High and the Lord used right there in the same verse talking about the same person. The God of Israel is the Most High. The God of Israel is El Yon. But what is Luke saying here? He's saying that John the Baptist is the prophet of the Most High who's going to prepare the way before the Lord. So whose way did John the Baptist prepare? He prepared the way before Jesus of Nazareth. So if we just continue that line of thinking, what is Luke saying here? He's saying that he's equating Jesus of Nazareth with the God of Israel. Jesus of Nazareth with El Yon, the Most High. He's equating Jesus of Nazareth with Yahweh. So as we've seen in this brief study here, it's consistent in the Old Testament, as even the scholars who don't hold to the same view that I hold admit, that the application of the title Elion to Yahweh was ubiquitous, as Theodore J. Lewis said, or as Mark S. Smith said, Deuteronomy 32, in telling the story of Israel's relationship with its God, begins with a single divine head, Yahweh El Elyon. So Yahweh is El Elyon, and this is consistent in the Old Testament. It's consistent in the Second Temple Jewish writings. It's consistent in the Septuagint. It's consistent in the New Testament. Yahweh is El Elyon. Thank you all for listening. Here are the sources that I used in preparing this study. And as always, if you enjoy the content, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to help the channel grow. Thank you all, God bless, and I'll talk to you in our next study.